We've come to Worksworth today to talk about the gentry, the 17th century gentry, bashing each other up and scrapping and quarrelling. Um, and also to talk about Worksworth as a town, which in the 1950s was in a state of near dereliction. And this was one of the most extreme examples of that dereliction. This building was listed in 1950 as a ruin. Its roof had fallen in in the 1940s. The Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust did the research, discovered it was built by someone called William Hopkinson. He was from a gentry family, but he made his money from lead mining and also by bashing up reluctant payers of tithes. He was in cahoots with a vicar here. So the vicar got him to head up a bunch of thugs to go around bashing up people who wouldn't pay their tithes. Yeah, and, and this town built on the, the lead mining industry, it's, it's all about lead here. Right back to Roman times, lead was what created the wealth here. And William Hopkinson got his money from lead. He owned lead mines up here. A characteristic of the 17th century houses here was the use of decorative plasterwork. Now that was either done in raised plasterwork or using a timber kind of pattern, pushing it into the wet plaster. So you got um, decorative motifs. What survived from the ruins of Hopkinson's house was the date, miraculously, of 1631 and um, this rather beautiful bird, which is one of these butterpress type patterns pushed into wet plaster. So this is the front door to William Hopkinson's high status building and in fact is the front door to his high hall chamber. This was the hall um, chamber of the house. We know from half tax returns of the 17th century that the six halves here represented the biggest house in Worksworth. He obviously came a cropper financially because we know from the uh, will and probate inventory of his mother that by the time she died she owned the property so she must have bailed him out of some financial difficulty. That probate inventory reveals that at the time of her death there were 41 beds in this building. That's a hell of a lot of beds. I mean, some were truckle beds underneath proper feather beds, but nevertheless, so a lot of people. A lot of people. Nevertheless, later on in the 1640s and 1650s, he regained his financial position. And in fact, the whole family were doing well at the time of the restoration. And his brother George, was, who was a lawyer, was doing sufficiently well to be granted a coat of arms from the College of Heralds. So the family were going up in status. And, and his brother was also barmaster. His brother was barmaster. And I think that's a, we need to unpack this hierarchy of the, the lead mining industry. If we start at the very top, we've got the king as Lord of the Manor of Worksworth, the Duchy of Lancaster. The King's Field. The King's Field has um, a, a claim over all mineral rights in, in Worksworth, um, appoints a barmaster who is res responsible for making sure the king is getting his skim off the top, um, a deputy barmaster who is the, the man on the ground, yeah. Um, making, he's doing all the hard work, the barmaster's a more ceremonial title. Um, and then there is this barmoat court, 25 people appointed to act as juries in, right in the times of disputes between the miners. Still meets in Worksworth once a year. <laughs> yeah, a, a continuing legacy. Uh, a steward of this barmoat court who's supposed to be totally independent of the king, of the barmaster, the deputy barmaster, and is, intervenes w and to, to provide impartiality. Um, and then right at the bottom of all of this, the lead miners themselves, who are the ones digging and extracting the lead. And you had the independent lead miners and then the employees. And William Hopkinson employed men to mine his land up here. 
So many layers of, uh, of interest in this. Yeah, uh, in this a, a complicated hierarchy. Yeah. This impressive panorama um, standing up here and looking down on this roofscape of the historic buildings of Worksworth and all of it built out of the wealth and prosperity of the lead industry. And the lead industry here goes way back. There was an inquiry in 1288 into the origins of the laws and customs of lead mining here and that inquiry revealed the fact, and I quote from the inquiry, the origins of them go back to time out of memory of man <laughs> in 1288. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the Norman conquest, which we think about as a very long time ago. And they're talking about it. Time out of memory of man. So this is something which has been in this, the, the lead mining has been here for a long, long time. Goes, goes back to Roman times. Yeah, to back to the Romans. And it's an interesting quirk that British history, throughout British history, there's always been this sanctity of property rights and land ownership and how that cannot be touched. And yet here you have the Duchy of Lancaster, the king, as lord of the manor. So it doesn't matter whether you are gentry, aristocrats, whatever you own, if a miner discovers lead ore on your land, they have a right to, to sink a, to a, sink shaft. a shaft and yes. extract. Yes, there were three ex exceptions to that. It couldn't be done in a graveyard or in an orchard or in a garden, but otherwise you just go ahead and sink a shaft. Because the, the king has this right to the minerals. Because it's, the, it's a royal manor and yeah. the crown has the rights and to I, the minerals. And I like thinking of the gentry with their estates and their land in the 17th century thinking, how dare you touch my land? But the, these miners could go in there and, and do what they wanted. Yes. And just looking across the, the town below us now, we can see so many important buildings from the history of, of the lead mining. Yes, I mean, here's one in front of us, um, Babington House built or rebuilt in the 17th century. And it's a very handsome building, isn't it? With beautiful Derbyshire stone slates and um, carboniferous limestone built from the actual quarry, the quarry face just below us here. Yeah. And you could spend a whole morning just looking across the different buildings and talking about the, the relevance to the, the history of the lead mining industry. But of course, one of the centers of authority here was the church. Yes. So shall we go down there, there it is. and have a look at some of the local notables and their tombs Let's go and look at the gel tombs. We've met the Hopkinsons, uh, and now it's time to meet another local notable family in the parish church of Worksworth with the, the gel family. So we've got... Um, Anthony. Anthony gel, Wraith gel, And Sir John. And Sir John is the protagonist of this story because yes. it's Sir John who, again, this gel family have significant rights over lead and, and own um, several lead mines. That's where their wealth came from, which provided the wealth for Anthony to found this school and the almshouses. And the almshouses. But William Hopkinson, who was acting for the vicar at that time, Robert Carrier, who was a particularly rapacious man who wanted every penny out of the tithe that he was due. And so Sir John was not paying his tithe. So Robert Carrier got William Hopkinson and his bunch of thugs to go and persuade Sir John with a threat of violence to pay up. But Sir John had an even bigger bunch of thugs who bashed up. William Hopkinson and his thugs. Robert Carrier's also member of the gentry, the vicar, and his yeah. wife was quite Jane hostile. Hare. She was equally rapacious and she 
on one occasion actually threatened a lead miner at the head of his shaft with a dagger, <laughs> saying, it is a matter of life or death for you to pay up. Yeah. And um, this was all reported uh, to the agents of the Crown. So they London. end up in hot water right at the top of the food chain in the star chamber, the they, king's court. They were tried in the king's court and ultimately sent to the fleet prison in London. So the vicar was dispossessed of his living. All of this going on, bubbling under the surface just before the English Civil War. A time of great trouble. So you've got the parliamentarians, the royalists and the gentry are taking sides and Sir John Jell with the parliamentarians and still doing business in, in the lead mining with royalists yeah. throughout the Civil War. Business is important, yeah. Nothing stops business. But Joe was a very violent man and he really went round. He actually married by force one of the um, gentry's wife because he'd, he'd, he'd just taken over, yeah. really. And, but ended up in the tower? Well, <laughs> He was discovered at one point having considered what might happen with the restoration. So he sent a message to Charles I, who was then, by then, imprisoned in Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight, and sent a message to him saying he could provide £900 in gold if he needed it. And the parliamentary forces discovered this message. And so he was put in jail yeah. by the parliament. He's, he's a chancer. He was a chancer. But, but all the way throughout this, they continue to get their dues from the lead mining from the industries. Lead mining. Yes. And they both pull through. Hopkinson pulls through. Sir John pulls through. And they make it out the other side of the Civil War. Charles II forgave Jell and gave him a post in court. <laughs> We're in the churchyard, so we have to talk about the tithes. Uh, the tithes being one tenth of your produce, which historically, pre-Reformation, had to go to the church. And the tithe brought in a lot of money, especially here because of the <clears throat> tithe on the lead mining. As late as 1852, just one lead mine in one year brought in £1,200 for the vicar. Now, in modern day terms, that's about 160000 It's a lot of money, and that's just one lead mine. And the, and the vicar using that money to pay for that, the that, rebuilding of the vicarage. That vicar in 1852, 1853, took down the rambling old Elizabethan vicarage, built a new Georgian polite vicarage with a a lawn where the old vicarage had been, and then created this perimeter walk because he thought it was <clears throat> very improper for people to crisscross the churchyard anywhere and to put their washing out as a drying green here. Yeah. And so he actually paid for the creation of this railed perimeter walk. Yeah. And it must have been so frustrating for anyone involved in the lead mining industry, the miners having to let go of a tenth of their dues to the church. I mean, after the Reformation, a lot of the gentry acquired the rights to the tithe. So it was the gentry themselves who were receiving the, the money from, from the tithe. Creaming it off. Yeah, and Hopkinson being one of them who... Hopkinson went round with his thugs, um, extracting the money from reluctant payers. Yeah. And gentry violence in works with. Yeah. And the, the tithe, um, something in, in, in the 1830s, the government recognised something needed to be done about kind of this difficulty of creaming off a tenth of all your produce. And so they commuted it to a form of payment, the, the Tithe Commutation Act 1836, and it just became a, a cold, hard exchange of cash. Yeah. We've been strolling around Workswith, which is now this charming town full of artists and has this very creative atmosphere. But by the 20th century, this place was really in decline. It was, it was spectacularly in decline because um, 
the economic base had disappeared. The, the lead mining was no longer profitable. That had been replaced by a textile mill and by quarrying. But the quarrying had terrific impacts. The quarry came very close into the town centre, just up the dale, literally a stone's throw away. Stones were flying everywhere, dust everywhere. In fact, the dust was so bad in the town centre that the butcher had to get his lad to come out with a bucket of water and throw it over the sides of beasts twice a day to get rid of the dust. That's how bad it was. I suppose it doesn't, everyone's probably vegan nowadays. <laughs> but this building, Hopkinson's house, was in a terrible state as well. How did it get like that? This was absolutely ruinous when it was listed in 1950. The roof had fallen in in the 40s and its declines really started in 1750 when its garden was taken by the man who built the house in the marketplace, who bought this house in order to take its garden for himself. And that's the steward of the Duchy of Lancaster, who is the king. He represented the lord of the manor. The lord of the manor was the king. So you do what you like if you Absolutely. Do. He was in charge. Top dog. Let's go and have a look at his house then. We can't come to works with without hearing how Barry Joyce, MBE, earned his title. So how did that come about? Well, it was partly my contribution to this regeneration project here that started in 1978. It was <clears throat> very early uh, idea of using conservation as an engine for social and economic regeneration. So it's, an, it's one of the earliest heritage-led regeneration schemes. Very early really, and quite really influential. Early. Yeah, and this is one of the, the houses you saved, perhaps? Well, this is one of the buildings that was in extreme state of disrepair, and the Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust restored it. Um, it's a long story, but basically the stonework was literally falling off. Um, so actually all the stonework had to be replaced. Um, one of the great supporters of the project was the late Duchess of Devonshire, and she used to ask of me House. of Chatsworth, and she used to ask me to occasionally give her a tour around to see how we were doing. And she wanted to. We were standing over there, and she pointed to this building and said, "Why aren't you doing that one? It's in a terrible state." And I said, "Well, it's lived in by a very elderly lady, and we don't want to." disturb her, we'll wait for her successor before we do it. And by that time we were walking up and she was peering into this room here and the owner was asleep on a chaise lounge underneath with her, with her arms crossed and she was like this. And the Duchess in that very strong Mitford 1930s voice that she had said, oh but she's dead. <laughs> She's quite dead. I think it's terribly cruel of you leaving her here mouldering like that. And at this point, the woman woke up, so we had to walk away. 